I've been to enough of these that they're often very boring. I don't want you to hear a resume from me that's very, very boring or what I did. What would you rather hear? Would you rather hear what I think makes a successful entrepreneur from my point of view? If that's yes, raise your hand. If you want to hear cool stuff I'm working on now, that raise your hand. That's okay. So maybe a little bit of both. Um, I need to tell you a little bit about myself first, uh, not the resume part. Everybody here has a special skill or a talent, and uh, whatever that is, it's got a corresponding uh, detriment with that. Um, one of my special talents is I talked to some other students uh, here a few months ago, and I told them that I can go to the mall, I can look around in the food court, and I can tell you pretty accurately who's married, who's not, how long they've been going out, if they have a problem, even who's going to go to the bathroom probably by weird things that they do that I just pick up and see. I notice, in that regard, I notice everything. I don't have to try. I don't have to do anything. It's just who I, it's just who I am. But I miss an enormous amount um, when it comes to certain aspects of my life. My wife will let you know immediately if you ask her. And to what a large extent I miss certain uh, emotional things or cues that she has, but other things I'm, I'm good at. Um, some of you, I call them high D people, just my, a certain personality profile index where you have, maybe you're the person who you are extremely detail oriented, you're very organized, you're frustrated by other people, you may be very sensitive to criticism. If you go late to church, you think everybody's looking at you. I love those people. I'm the opposite of that, but I love those people. Um, but I can't work with any of those people unless I have somebody else in between to act as a translator um, between us. Because I don't get offended at anything. Nothing is a criticism to me. It's just data. It's just what is. And, but they're usually the experts in their area. I'm a, I know a lot about a lot of different things, but there's always somebody that knows to a much deeper level the specific thing they're working on. And so I try to pin myself with those people uh, to be successful. But literally, we, we can't work, and I need somebody in between. So I'm a super type A, know-it-all. Um, I'm one of those that actually knows it all, which is good. Not one of the know-it-alls that, that don't, but. Um, yeah, I'm kind of a bully. I want things my way. Um, and I do better doing 30 things at once than if I work on one thing for an hour straight. Uh, it's just how I uh, am. And that's disruptive for a lot of other people. So early on, I was really lucky. And I've, done, I've sold nine different businesses. Um, two of them were under a million, but the rest were either tens of millions or hundreds of millions. So I know how to do it. Um, but my way will not be your way, I promise. And if you look at somebody and you try to emulate what you're doing and you're not that person, it's a foregone conclusion that you will fail, in my opinion. Um, you will. And so knowing what you're good at and what you are not good at is, is key for what you guys are doing here. And sometimes it's hard to see that in yourself. So I'm great at starting something and building it to a certain level. But when that ends, I know it's time for me to go. There's somebody else that's better than me to take it from that point and go forward. And it's a certain type of arrogant person to think that they're the best uh, really at every step. And you guys don't want to make that mistake. And if you find yourselves trying to be an entrepreneur and you're very, uh, because you have a, a very high level of technical knowledge in an area, 
but you feel limited a little bit by your tolerance for risk, then instead of trying to work on being riskier, partner up with somebody that you trust that does not see that as risk but opportunity so that you can let them do their part, which is propelling a company forward while you do your part, making the best uh, technical products that you can. If you need, I have a million people around me to help me be organized. The reason I'm late today is because I wrote down 350, even though I clearly remember them saying 350 is when it ends and the Q&A is later. So it, I relied on myself and I blew it as usual. On the plus side, I can say I've driven over 100 miles an hour in University Avenue now. I couldn't say that before. So um, that's a, I think this is my alarm saying I'm supposed to be speaking in a little while. And then I have, uh, you'll hear it go off like two other times. I'm going to leave it and not turn those off just so you can see that really is me. I need three or four alarms because I do, I get uh, so distracted. Um, I'm the dog and up. Right, I'm squirrel, 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 that's me. So I set constant alarms, but I know that's what I am and I use that as an advantage and have people around me that don't. And a lot of young entrepreneurs, I have to say that's the thing I probably notice the most, that they believe they can do everything and I believe you can too, you just can't do it by yourself. Um, how many of you, I'm curious to see, would consider yourself a type A personality. You know it all, you're bossy, you interrupt everybody because you can't stand their slow answer. I'll proudly do it, I'll have two hands, that's me. I'm surprised actually at that. Who's an introvert versus an extrovert? Introverts first. Extroverts, so it's about 13 or so of you that didn't vote? Okay, you guys are introverts primarily. So, <laughs> to me, anyway. Um, when I was at BYU, uh, I started selling computer parts. Uh, I'd sold a few before my mission. I went on my mission to Taiwan. Um, but nobody would buy from me because I was 17. Uh, so I, I only did phone orders and then I would pretend to be the delivery boy. Uh, and then I would, you know, deliver the products and, and, and in some cases install them. And after a little bit, most of the places figured it out, but they were okay because at that point they had bought some stuff and they were okay. Uh, but by the, my last semester at BYU, uh, I had 35 employees. I was working 60 hours a week and going to school full time, and I had gotten married about 18 months before. There was no way. So I actually never graduated. So I have nine and a half credits left, and my mom lets me know every time still when I see her that, uh, that I'm a college dropout. But um, but I knew what I wanted, and I, and I did it. And everybody around me told me I was an idiot and to a large extent, they were right, because I was taking a very large risk and not, by not graduating. And I was way too, uh, actually, I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna change what I was going to say. I knew I wasn't going to fail. I didn't think I, that I wasn't going to fail. I knew I wasn't. But not because it was just this blind, intense hope, but because I had laid out every step that I needed to do and there was nothing that was hard in that. There might have been a lot of steps, but they were all very doable. And uh, I'm not going to stand up here and say, you need to be one of those people that writes down all your goals and does that, because I've never written down anything in my life. And if I did, I'm sure I would have written the wrong thing or the wrong time. Uh, but in my head, it was always there. I had to tell myself to do something else besides think of that goal. Uh, I didn't need to be reminded. And so if you're working on something that makes you feel that way, you're going to be successful. Now, whether or not you should be successful at something is the hard part. Intelligence is doing something in a very uh, good, 
efficient, smart, unique, innovative way. Wisdom is whether or not you should have done that thing in the first place. And a lot of entrepreneurs are very intelligent and not very wise. You have to know what you're doing is, is going to work. Um, and I was reading the Steve Jobs book about that at some point. And he said, I don't ask anybody uh, if they want my product because I haven't told them what they want yet. And I feel the same way. Like the things that I'm working on, I'm not interested in getting feedback from other people because it's like asking somebody if, you know, what features they want in their covered wagon. If you're building cars, you don't ask somebody you know, what they want in their covered wagon. You build a car. And so when I started these companies, I knew I could be successful, but I felt inside what was the right thing to do. And maybe that was a wise thing or not, but I think I just know that. And if you're one of those people who just knows that, great. But if you don't feel that supreme confidence, uh, you guys have all seen Shark Tank, I'm sure. You see people that come, come in that are so passionate about what they're doing. And I'm certain there are many uh, companies that go through there where the sharks didn't think it was good because their job is to manage risk and give themselves their best opportunity for success. And so if something is less likely to do that, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It just means you better be very determined and have laid out a plan that will make it successful. And then some of them are just downright horrible ideas. But yeah, if you're not one of those people, I, I caution you to move forward um, because this time in your life is really the time where you must be successful. Because if you're not married, you probably will be soon. Your tolerance for risk, your ability to tolerate risk going forward is going to diminish over time because you have a family or other responsibilities. And so you need to be right, and you need to be right now. How many of you feel like if you're how many of you have an idea that you have in the back of your mind you want to do or you're actively pursuing it? How many people have no idea but they know they want to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> That's good. You guys are extra brave for raising your hand. I appreciate that. Um, I've been that way a couple of times. Usually I have 30 things I want to do and I pick two. But there's been a couple of times in my life when I've sold something and I don't know what to do next. And for me, those are actually the most unhappy times in my life by far. How many of you that raised your hand that said you had an idea now feel 95% confident or greater that you believe your idea would be successful and you could implement it in less than a year? OK. What about 80% confident? 50%? I'm really curious why the other people raised their hands and said they had an idea that they really wanted to do, but they were less than 50% confident in its success. If there was somebody in that group, how many were in that group that said, I'm not 50% confident, but I had an idea? There was more than that. I counted. I know. <laughs> anyway, that's not bad. My opinion is, if you don't feel it, though, if you really don't feel it, it might be a good idea. But there's always somebody you're competing with that loves it, that eats, drinks, and sleeps that idea. And if you're not that person, you're going to lose. You're going to lose every time. So if you don't believe in it all the way, it won't happen. So I, sold a I, I had these computer stores. And I was just doing it to make money. I used to put three by five cards up in the Wilkinson Center. That's how I started on the computer stores, uh, my computer business. I, I would buy like 10,000 floppies from uh, Soft Copy, who made all the copies of the floppies for WordPerfect. Um, I would sell those. I used to sell a ton of those. And because I went on my mission to Taiwan, I spoke Mandarin Chinese. I started uh, 
just uh, buying parts from California and later bringing in containers worth of equipment. And that was, it was a good business, but it was a very hard business, but I learned something. I learned I didn't want to sell something and make money forever. I wanted to do something once and make money every time. I didn't want to have to recreate the sale. And I also learned that cheap labor is cheap and it's not beneficial for the business. E each time I did a business, I learned something that I did not know before that I incorporated. But I'll, I'll save you, you know, from explaining all the different businesses I've done. If you're in the Q&A or even if there's time right here, I'll tell you about some of them. But I did a computer store. I did some stats software. I was the first one on the internet to actually do referring web pages and uh, website statistics, like Google Analytics type software. I know that sounds crazy. And then uh, I opened my big mouth to a few people uh, when I shouldn't have. And that's actually where Omniture came from. So Josh James can say thanks to that. For <laughs> I'm a big idiot. I always do that. I get excited and I tell everybody. But, but you know what? He, uh, he did what I wouldn't do. He loves the corporate culture and I hate it. I despise it. I've, he loves to raise money. He loves to, I don't, I don't even know what C, CEO activities are. I don't really know, you know, whatever that means to, you know, whoever. I, I, that's not me. I've never raised money for any business ever. And I never will. And if it doesn't make money in a short, certain period of time, or at least has a plan to do so, then I, I won't even begin it. But I did computer stores. I did uh, a couple of different stat tracking software. Uh, and because I was the first one on the internet to do that, everybody was using the software. And uh, there's a, I think it's called, I don't know what the building, you guys know where Stans is on 9th East? Right behind Stans, there's this little building. It used to be called the Palace. You go uh, dancing there. Anyway, they had this little closet, and that's where all my servers <laughs> were. So Microsoft flew out and wanted to buy me, and they're like, well, where's your office? And I said, I have my servers down in the old Palace building. And they're like, where's your office? I'm like, let's go, you know, let's go see my spare bedroom. They're like, well, where are all your employees? And I'm like, they're like, we can't even buy you. It's just you. You know, if you get hit by a bus, your company's uh, gone, uh, which was true. And so I thought, you know, maybe I should divest myself. It was good. I was making lots of money. Uh, and I thought it was a lot of money. I was like 24, 25, and it, I was selling ads with this stats. And I was making like, I was making pretty good money. Some months, like 40,000 up to... 90 or 100,000, so it was really good. But uh, I ended up selling it to about.com back when they were relevant. They're, you know, uh, this is in late 90s, and or 97-ish, 98 or something. And it opened my eyes. The very first month after they bought it, they sold out my ads for like $1.3 million. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't believe it because I thought I was the king of the world. And I really learned from that that uh, I wanted to do everything myself because I don't trust very many people to do it perfect. But if I did not learn to trust people, uh, I was going to shortchange myself every time. So I learned about computer hardware, cheap labor, inexpensive doesn't necessarily mean uh, you're saving anything. I needed to have a creationist uh, attitude instead of, of preservationist. Invest in my em employees and what they would bring for me rather than see the least I could expense in order to get you know, some end result. Then I learned I needed a lot more people. And then I started doing free web hosting. And during this time, I'm learning how to scale the internet, like scale things, because hardware back then was terrible. So when you're serving 40 million banner ads, on hardware from 1994, that's pretty hard to actually uh, accomplish. Um, it's hard to accomplish now for uh, a lot of companies, but it was very, very difficult. But I, I'm very grateful that I did all those things myself and didn't outsource part of that. And so that's my next piece of advice. Learn every single part of your business and then know what you're good at 
and give that out to other people who are better than you at that thing. But you can't run a business that you do not understand. Um, he said I was a CEO of Bluehost, by the way, and I'm not. I sold it off, and I'll tell you about that, but I sold it a few years ago. Um, but I, uh, I kept the building they were in, and I built a big data center in it, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But know your, know your business. If you think you don't need to know that part because somebody else is taking that aspect from you, you're going to fail when it gets big, in my opinion. And maybe our definitions of fail are different, Fail to me is not being able to uh, extract the value out of a business that I otherwise could have had I done it correctly and understood the business better. That's failing to me. Um, and then also the traditional sense of failing, which is you're not gonna make money, you go out of business. So, so I started doing uh, free web pages, um, always with banner ads because I just, I didn't have to go out and sell to individual people. I just would sell to a few uh, advertisers. And I started getting 50 or 60,000 people signing up every day um, because I gave away so much space, which makes me laugh now because at the time, everybody was giving away one or two megabytes of space for free web hosting. And I was giving away 50 megs. So it was called 50megs.com. So much space, you know, this unbelievable massive amount. And uh, and I, I learned very, uh, very well how to do some distributed computing techniques to have it really grow width-wise and not fall apart. And later, um, as I started selling this free, or doing this free web hosting, I wanted to have a paid product. So we did a paid product. It was, it was just okay. It wasn't great. And so uh, I'm skipping a few businesses in between there, but... Uh, I wanted to do more paid services, so I, I looked around for domain names, and Bluehost is not a great name. I still paid 1500 bucks for it, but uh, I had Jethost. Jethost is better, right? Jethost? Raise your hand. Bluehost? Who likes Jethost? Bluehost? Yeah, they're both kind of crappy, huh? Yeah. I, <laughs> I just wanted one syllable, something you could remember, and uh, so, and uh, I'm not very creative. My website for the computer stores was computerwarehouse.com. Stats was freestats.com. My next one was sitetracker.com, and 50megs.com, and then I had this other one called zerocatch.com for Yahoo, so it started with zero, for like no catches, and anyway, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not creative to come up with Hulu or something, but the Bluehost, <coughs> I really learned the thing that it would, I would invite you guys to uh, consider when you're doing a business. <coughs> Do what you love. Sorry, I'm joking here. <coughs> they should have a mute button right here when you're coughing, huh? That's a business right there waiting to happen. Or maybe it does and I just don't see the button. Um, how many of the businesses that you guys raise your hands on have a recurring revenue stream associated with it? Any of you? If you can do that, I would highly suggest you do in some way or another. The reason that's good is because if you can do the hard work to get somebody there, you don't have to keep doing the hard work. You just do hard work to get new people there. My eyes were opened with Bluehost. Um, I would, I would, I had, uh, I pay large affiliate fees at Bluehost. Somebody would sign up, they'd pay $95 uh, a year essentially for hosting. Sometimes it was higher or lower. I got to the point where I'd pay $240 for each uh, affiliate that signed up, even though my gross was $95.40. Sounds like a good way to go out of business, huh? I made an enormous amount of money doing that. And I did because if the product was good enough, and please don't judge what I did by its current state, but uh, if the product is good enough and they stay long enough and you believe in it, if you can acquire customers, and pay a lot to get them, you can make a lot of money. 
is I wasn't bought for how much money I was making. It depends. If you're small, you're bought on how much money you're making. If you're medium, you're bought on kind of your potential as a growth company. And when you're big, you're usually bought because somebody needs your technology for what they have and then they apply it to their 20 million customers and they extract way more. And so if you're building a platform that can acquire additional customers, you can fall into that middle or end category and make an enormous amount of money compared to a small business. But if you love what you're doing and there's no recurring revenue, then do that. I used to think when I was your age, I always said I wanted to make a lot of money. I did not want to make a lot of money. I wasn't articulating myself very well. I wanted control. I'm a control freak. Uh, I wanted to con control to be able to do what I wanted and when I wanted. That's what I wanted. And maybe some of you, you all have different reasons. But if you know what you want, then use your business as a means of getting that thing. I can't stress how important that is. Really know what you want. And if you don't know, don't start a business. Because if what you want is at odds with your business, even if the business is successful, you will be unhappy. And I've done businesses where I was stuck and I was unhappy. And ultimately, that's what Bluehost turned into for me. Because I'm somebody who wants to be nimble and do things really well. And I extract value personally when I can uh, squeeze the most juice out of, a, out of a lemon and make the best lemonade from that. That's personally what I want to do. So sometimes somebody will look at me and say, you're such an idiot. You're not making as much money as you can from this business. And I'm not an idiot. I just have a different set of, uh, I have different goals than what they themselves value. So if you're gonna have a partner and you have different goals, Sometimes that's okay, and sometimes that's disastrous. Right? I can want to make my wife happy. That's one goal. And I certainly didn't have the goal of seeing another Freddie Prince Jr. movie. I know that, like 15 years ago. So I can go to that, I can go to that with my wife. My wife might have, might have this goal, and I want to make my wife happy. We have two different goals, but they match together, so it was okay. Right? But if you have a different one with your partner and you don't understand that when you go into business, it'll be a problem for you later on. So I learned all these things as I went along and I'm, I'm in the middle of Bluehost and, and it started just growing so, so quickly. We were signing up, jeez, 30,000 new paying customers every month that were, was recurring revenue. But I was, and, and our, our, uh, our signups, 50% were coming from word of mouth, which, was, which is really, really high when you're doing that number of signups. If I wasn't uh, doing a lot of affiliate, it would be much higher. But with the number of affiliate we had and 50%, so a company came and looked at us that acquired a bunch of other hosting companies. And we were by far, it wasn't even close. They'd acquired 37 other companies, but we were by far the best word of mouth company they had ever bought with the corresponding affiliate part. And they ran all these tests, uh, all this uh, user feedback, all this just what I consider to be just utter rubbish uh, that they spent a ton of money on for what was so obvious, which is if I'm on the phone, especially being me, 60 seconds into it, I don't care who answers on the other end. I'm going to chew their head off. I'm so angry and I'm so upset. And so I wanted our whole times to be no longer than six seconds. And I chose six seconds because that's time for it to ring across the call center and then have uh, everybody have a chance to answer the phone at least twice before somebody had a problem. And by the way, the people who answered the phone first when they didn't have to, they were worth their weight in gold. I always would give those people every, you know, their salary if they were just you know, come out of BYU or something. It might be $40,000 or something. But those people, I would come and at Christmas time, I'd just give them like $30,000 extra. And they were worth every penny. And they deserved it. 
Because when there's 100 people and you don't have to do it and you can hide and you choose to do it, that's the person that you want. I love those people. They were the greatest. You don't learn it unless you've learned it way before you're 18. You don't change later. Um, I just don't believe that, that, that those people change. But then Bluehost grew so big, I couldn't affect any change at all. It was very, very frustrating. Um, it felt like I was trying to change a cruise ship. And that just doesn't, that didn't fit my personality. And the product itself was just mediocre. We were the best of the worst. You know, we were the least stinkiest dump in the state. You know, that's what shared hosting was for me. And uh, I like to say the truth of what something is. So instead of saying, hey, it was great, I just said what it was. Shared hosting was not very good. Uh, just the way it operated, the whole structure. And um, I wanted to make it way better. So uh, I couldn't put any of my servers anywhere in Utah. There wasn't enough, there wasn't enough uh, connectivity in the state there wasn't enough power in one facility to put our servers. So uh, I bought the old Covey call center. You can see it right off of the, right behind the green of hole number one on East Bay Golf Course. There's this kind of ugly white building with this green stripe around it. And you see all these things that look like some rotting tin man on the roof. That's my airflow experiments for the data center. But it ran right by the railroad tracks and that's where a lot of fiber optic uh, stuff is run. And I'd never built a data center ever, but me just being me and just uh, an idiot, I said, yeah, I'll just build a data center, no problem. Uh, so I built uh, a data center, uh, me and a ping pong friend of mine, of course. Um, yeah, I don't even play anymore, but uh, my eyes got worse, and now I can't keep up, and I can't stand to play somebody I used to beat and lose. I just can't take that. So I'm taking my ball and go home, right? Like a little kid, that's, that's essentially what I'm doing. But uh, I build this data center, and right now it has like 28,000 physical servers in it, and it consumes an enormous amount of power. The only, BYU is the only facility that takes more, and I'm building another one that I'm just starting in a month, and that one will take way more power than BYU. Uh, and it'll be small. It, it, I'll fit it in 12,000 square feet. I'll take more, way more power than all of BYU. Um, it, 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 it's very hot there, by the way. But we built the data center, and I said, wouldn't it be nice to use all the outside air to cool it? Um, and I'd learned what I had from Bluehost. I was getting ready. We moved everything in. Um, I, I decided I'd wanted to sell Bluehost. We were cleaning it up. I wasn't the right person to run it anymore. Um, but I always kind of have ties to the previous company. It's just kind of what I do. I kind of make them beholden to me because I'm that control freak. So I'm like, buy Bluehost, but you have to rent the building and you must lease the data center. Uh, and it was actually a good deal. It saved them like $8 million a year, but it was a $58 million contract so it was a good deal. So I said, but it was good for them. It really was. Uh, so it was a good exit for me for Bluehost. I wanted to sell it. But then we, we, I built this data center to use outside air. I got a couple of minutes. And it was, it was impossible. The airflow problem there, I can't tell you. I thought it was a two to the fifth problem. You know, I'm like, oh, there's you know, chillers. There's a crack unit, which is computer room air conditioning unit. You know, there's maybe these outside wall louvers, um, exhaust fans, and like the pump temperature. Well, then it turned into a two to the 15th problem. What is that? 65, 536? 32, 768? One of those two. Um, I can't code that. Nobody can code that. <laughs> and it was an extremely hard problem. You guys are probably run into stuff like that. But what was good is we ended up being the most efficient air-cooled data center in the world. But I had to figure out a problem. It beats Facebook's, it beats everybody's. It's awesome. Um, I could see it in my head how the math should work, but I couldn't do the math. 
but I have a buddy that works at the quantum cryptography division at the NSA. And I had him help me with the math, but I couldn't, but he argued and argued. He couldn't make it go together. He couldn't, he couldn't figure it out. He kept saying I was doing it wrong. He even had me talk to this professor, uh, uh, control systems professor at Princeton. And we just were oil and water, because he's like, it has to be this way. And I'm like, nothing has to be anyway. So, and we just argued. Um, but now we've got this uh, algorithm that things can fail in the data center. I have no idea how, to, how or why something is going to break, and it just fixes itself and knows. And it's at odds with every controls book out there in the industry. Nothing is like it. It's completely different. I know we're doing it a unique way because I see all these libraries to do math, to solve the math problem, and, but they're all used to make a binary decision instead of this kind of analog choice that I was using it for. So I couldn't even use any library, so I knew I was onto something uh, good. But it's just a different set of problems. I just ended up selling the data center for a little bit. Uh, for a, I made a lot off of it, and then I uh, sold it for for like 80 million or 85 million or something like that. And um, because I didn't want it anymore, because it was kind of crappy. The airflow part was good, but it couldn't hold very. It couldn't. It couldn't uh, hold the density of the servers. But when I bought the data center, I realized, that's great, I know about hardware, it's great, I know about hosting and scaling, but I was still buying uh, bandwidth from other providers. So I started buying dark fiber. You guys maybe always hear about Utopia, now they're always having financial problems. So I'm like, oh, you have financial problems, I've got money, you know, let's get together. And uh, so I started buying a, a, a bunch of dark fiber. And fiber is unique because just the amount of colors in a color wheel or is how much data you can send across fiber. So I can send, with the equipment that I have, down one pair of fiber, I can take all the world's concurrent internet traffic at the same time and put it down one pair of fiber. And it doesn't even, it's not even approaching at all what its capacity is, which I love because I can compete with companies like Level 3 and XO and AT&T and Verizon, and they hate it because they spent billions and billions of dollars running big old, you know, massive uh, cables with just enormous amount of fiber, and I can come in and I don't even need two fibers, I don't even need a pair, I can do all the world's internet down one bi-directional, one fiber cable. And so that was the next business, and then I looked at everything together, and that's my current project. Uh, and uh, I call it better servers. It's coming out really soon. But of course, it's just my arrogant side. It's better. And then just servers, you know, no fancy name again. But uh, <laughs> you know what it is. My tagline's going to be uh, unfortunate acronym, great servers, right? Because <laughs> you think about better servers, I'm always writing, writing it down like, oh, BS, that doesn't sound very good. <laughs> and our API is the BS API. And then anyway, so. <laughs> I tried to change it a little bit and say better servers and storage, but it was still BS. Anyway, I, uh, anyway, I reworked it. But uh, yeah, it takes everything from the hardware and every other business kind of flowed and cascaded into this thing that I'm doing uh, now. And that'll be the same with what you guys uh, are doing. You'll work on something, you'll be solving some problem, and then you'll realize there's a bigger problem and it's time to move on from this one. And I encourage you to be as successful as you can now so you have the freedom to do that later. If you do, man, you will, you will have something that everybody else dreams of, which is really the freedom to do what you want um, when you want. Uh, I had to be successful because there's no way I wouldn't get fired from any job I ever had because they say, let's do it this way. And I'm like, words do not describe how bad that idea is. Uh, I, you know, I need the Adamic language to accurately say how horrible it is. Like, it, you know, that's how I, and that just doesn't go over well in a workplace usually. So, um, 
I felt like that. But you guys, you have that chance. Uh, take it and have a problem that you can finish and move on to the next thing. And don't let anybody tell you you cannot do it because you can. Those words are the worst. It just makes me want to do it. So, uh, sorry, I was all over the place. I was going to actually prepare something decent, but when you're driving 100 miles an hour, I couldn't multitask that much. So, but I hope you learned something from it. But do what you love. If you remember anything from this, do what you love so that you will be successful at what you do. Thanks for having me.